Kravitza tracks it down in front. Matthews to Marner. After her, he can score! John Tavares, overtime winner! This is absolutely unbelievable by Austin Matthews. A complete turnaround. Kick the kick. To Mitch Marner. Hi, everyone, and welcome to From the Booth. I'm John Bartlett alongside Greg Millen. Glad you could join us today as we are joined by our hockey insider for Hockey Night in Canada and Sportsnet, Elliot Friedman. Yeah, Elliot, just a wonderful storyteller, so I'm excited about having him on our show here. Great background and the diversity in his career, how he started. So please welcome Elliot Friedman. Elliot, you're still a busy man these days. How are you in all of this going on? I tell people... If the worst problem I have is boredom, I'm doing really well. So I think that's the worst problem I have. I, uh, I've been working on some stuff. I've got, uh, I've got a big uh, oral history I worked on that's coming out this weekend. We're doing the podcast like you guys. We're doing make work projects. So we're working. We're trying to show that we actually have value and we're working. Well, I think we're, I think, I think we're all at that. I mean, Elliot, I'm, we're going to go all over the place with this today, but I'm going to start with the uh, with your family. You got okay. Four sisters. Wow. I mean, oh, how, God. how was that being around four sisters and how has that influenced your career, your life, everything? Boy, oh, we're going heavy early. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I would always joke that the reason I didn't get married till I was 39 because I had four sisters. <laughs> uh, you know, you know well, two are blood and two are step. So yeah. my father remarried, and uh, so there were three of us, and then we added two more. And uh, I remember, like, there, uh, my dad would meet people with all of us, and people would be like, are these all your kids? And they, they'd look at my father and my stepmother, and they'd be like, wow, like, you guys are to be admired. And they're like, well, we can't take credit for all of them. <laughs> but the line I used to get the most, guys, was um, – you might find this really hard to believe, but I am the least attractive of the five of us. And I used to get a lot of what happened to you. So <laughs> oh, nice. I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> that's, that's very nice of you to say, Johnny, I have to say. <laughs> now we're going to go right into your start in broadcasting. I know okay. it was the University of Western. Uh, yep. A little bit about it. Maybe you could share with uh, young broadcasters and everybody in general. I'm sure they're curious how it all started. You know, for me, uh, Greg, I was a guy, I was probably like, well, you know, Millsy, you were a player and a really good one. So, you know, that was your path. I'm probably more, well, you know what? Hey, Millsy, I'll tell you this, like working in hockey night, you learn how good you have to be just to play one game in the national hockey. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. You got to be, you're the elite of elite if you step onto the ice once. Um, you know, I think my, my career is probably some way similar to John. Like, you know, I love sports. I knew I wasn't going to play at a high level. So you start to look for another path where you can still be part of it. And um, I chose Western because Western had a really good student newspaper. I think like a lot of people of my generation, I'm 49 years old. I wanted to write for Sports Illustrated. Like that was my goal. That's what I wanted to be. And Western had a student newspaper that uh, sent a lot of people into media. And so I went there for that reason. You know, I didn't go to class. I worked on the student newspaper. And it was kind of my role. I, I turned into a pretty good reporter. That's always been my strength and, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and things kind of went up that way. And, you know, when I got to school in 93, it was a little tough. It was tough to find work and I scrambled for a while. And uh, thanks to some help, I got in at the fan as a volunteer and I, and I kind of went that way. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the one thing I would always tell people, guys, and, and you guys all see this, is that now this generation, their advantage is there's more ways to get noticed. Like it used to be before you were either a writer or you were a player or, or John, you were a broadcaster and you started small and you hope to move your way up now with zoom and YouTube and Snapchat and TikTok and Twitter, you can get yourself out there more than we could in our generation. And that's the, that's the biggest advantage that this generation has over us. You talked about going to Western because of the paper, the Gazette, and the reputation yeah. it had. Was there a time where you thought writing would be your path as opposed to broadcast, or did you always think maybe they would mirror each other along the way and, and work parallel? No, I, I always thought 
uh, I always thought that I was going to be uh, a writer. Um, you know, I, I've told the story about my first ever uh, interview in in television, and uh, I think actually was, I think this one was my second ever interview in television. I was told I just wasn't good looking enough to be in TV, which I know is impossible to believe, but I was actually told. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so, and I always thought I was going to be a writer. I, um, I, I always thought I was better at it. And, uh, so I kind of thought it would be that way, but I, you know, I couldn't get a job in writing and I was full time anyway. And I was very lucky that I, uh, ended up in this particular direction. Dan Shulman. Yep. A letter, uh, could you tell us a bit about that on the way up? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't know Dan really well. Uh, one of my sisters used to be best friends growing up with um, uh, Dan's sister, who is a pretty prominent, I think, nutritionist and, and dietitian now in the Toronto area. Our, her name is Joey. And, uh, but, you know, I didn't know Dan. And, you know, obviously Dan hit it big pretty, pretty early and well-deservedly. And, um, you know, I, I was trying to get in at the fan. And I wrote him a letter and, uh, you know, I just said, um, you know, Howard Berger was another guy who helped me, but I wrote Dan a letter. I said, look, I'm not looking for a job. I, I just want advice. And he called me and he said, uh, you know, that, that was a good way of writing the letter. And he introduced me to Scott Metcalf and, and it kind of worked from there as a, as a volunteer, but I do try to help some people now. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere if, uh, nobody helped me. So I try to help people now because, I really do believe this, guys, and um, you I, you guys could both tell me if you think I'm wrong, but anybody can open up a door for you, but if you're an idiot, it won't matter. Like, you could have, you could have the best sponsor in the world, but if you're an idiot, it's not going to matter. But so if someone's going to open up a door for you, take it, because you will still determine whether or not you're successful. One of the things you got to do uh, was venture a little bit into my side of the world with play-by-play when you were doing that with the Raptors in the early days. Uh, I know a lot of, you know, as you said, from writing, interviewing, and then the play-by-play element. Um, How did you approach that? How did you enjoy that now that you look back as to what you do now and, and sort of reflect on that time? Well, I loved it. I I, I thought it was, um, you know, I think that it's it's really interesting to me, John, how play-by-play has changed. Um, when we grew up, you know, there was Danny Galvan, big personality, uh, Rene LeCavalier, big personality, Bob Cole, as Millsy, you worked with, like huge personality, but they believed you called what was said on the ice and then, you know, you kind of moved on and it, it changed. And, um, uh, I think that I, when I called Raptors play by play, the guy like uh, John Saunders was the guy and his schedule in the States was increasing and he couldn't do as many Raptor games. And, you know, I filled in a few games for him and then, you know, I didn't take the job full time. I don't think they were really that interested in me full time, to be honest. Um, and they hired Chuck Swirsky, who was the right guy at the right time for what the Raptors needed. He was a far better fit at that time than what I could have been. And I just think that uh, even now, like in my job, I'm not that showy. Like I think I've got a decent sense of humor and I go for good lines here and there, but you know, like just the crazy lines and stuff like that, JB, it doesn't come naturally for me. And uh, I think that's always the biggest challenge I found in play by play was I like to play it pretty straight, but a lot of the guys now, they are so entertaining. Um, I would really need to work at it a lot to get to that level because I think it's important. I think the fans need it. You moved on to the score and yep. the importance of the score and uh, how that developed your career to get you into uh, early days in hockey night. Well, it was huge. It gave me it. It, it gave me experience. You know, Millsy, the best thing that um, I liked about the score is it, it would probably be akin to playing for an expansion team, right? You all get thrown in the water and and who swims and who drowns. And I thought that was the great thing about the score. We all got thrown in the water and who swam and who drowned. And uh, I I know I took on water at certain points, but I generally, I I generally, (laughs) I generally swam pretty well. And uh, you know, I liked it. Um, I learned a lot about what was good and like, I never like, 
you know, you're looking at me now, you'll still think I don't care how I look, but I, I never cared how I looked. I, I wasn't worried. Like, you know, it's like, guys, you realize like if your tie is sideways, nobody's paying attention to what you're saying. <laughs> if your collar's up, nobody is paying attention to what you're saying. You know, you learn all of those little things. Oh my God, this picture. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell you a story about that picture. Uh, but, and then know, I want the story on that one too. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll, let, I'll do the picture in a second. But, you know, like it just I learned, Milsey, what I learned was all the little things about TV and, you know, what you have to do to do right little things that you don't really, that I don't really care about that really matter. Like I'll, I'll, like I watched, there was one on Sportsnet like not too long ago. Where, like, Millsy, for example, right now I'm looking at you, and I just see it myself, and usually it makes me crazy. The cord from our earphones is, is hanging on the front. Yeah, and I, yeah I know. And I saw it on a Sportsnet booth hit, like, a few months ago, and it made me crazy. Yep. And that was the best thing about the score, was not only the experience, but it taught me that if you're going to do TV right, you have to worry about the little things. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, I tried. I wanted to do it backwards, but it doesn't work. The wire over like the wood. And, and I'm the but same it, way. In it the makes front me of it, crazy. Do? Yeah. I know. I know. All right. <laughs> you, want, you want to hear the story about that picture? picture? Yeah. Okay. So, so here's the deal with that picture. So that picture was, um, so I went to Western, as you guys know, and one time I was invited up to speak to a class. I think it was the journalism class or, or, or media studies class or whatever. So it was, it was 8 a.m. on a weekday morning or 8.30 in the weekday morning. So I figured I'd go up the night before and they, they put me up in a hotel. And of course, I told some guys that I knew I was coming back and we go out and we get hammered. And the next morning I wake up and I'm, <laughs> I'm late and I'm disheveled and I'm like, oh my God. And I, I throw myself ready. I, I don't think I comb my hair. I don't think I shave. It's like, ah, these are college kids, university kids. They won't care. So at the end of it, somebody goes, can I take a picture of you? And, and it's, it's that photo. And it got published in like the student paper. So it goes on. The <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. So the story as it goes is, and with memory, I can't remember exactly how it happened. I can't remember if I was, when I was single, I did some online dating or I was going out on a blind date and somebody Googled and the, and the woman Googled and found that picture. And she goes, is this you? And I go, I go, I have to tell you that that is the worst picture of me. I, like, I'm not telling you I'm Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt or anything like that. But I am telling you that's the worst picture of me ever taken. And if you can handle that being the worst picture of me ever taken, you won't think I'm too unattractive. And so that was that, was that line. So whenever I would have a blind date or something, I think I might have even put it on my internet dating profile with the line, this is the worst photo of me ever taken. That's pretty smart. Wow, yeah. that, that got you some traction, I'm sure. It was not bad. Not it worked. Not bad. Not I bad. Had... Not bad. Not bad. Now, you know, pe people like the approach, Milsey, too. There were people with good senses of humor. They're like, yeah. oh, normally, yeah. like people are lying to me. They say they're six foot two when they're five foot eight or whatever. Now, I like that you're telling me the truth. Now I got to ask you about the early days in hockey night. Yeah. I'm not going to bring up any old stories, Shirley Najak, for you. I'll leave that one alone, unless no, you want okay. to. Unless you want to tell you, that you, story at all, but I won't. You can. You can uh, hit. You can hit. <laughs> oh, I'm good with it. I, I'm, uh, I'm here. We're, we're all here to laugh. We're here to laugh. Here we are. No, I, I'm going to fast forward and leave it alone. I want to talk okay. about Bob Cole, and I know how much you meant to Bob Cole and how much you did for Bob Cole that people really don't know about. And I know you've got some wonderful Bob Cole stories. Some you probably don't choose to tell because they're so funny, but others that I'm sure that you would tell. And I, by the way, I just talked to him this week. He's doing well. Good. Uh, maybe share a couple of early days in hockey night. You were the reporter. I was with you for a lot of them. Shirley Najak was playing tricks on you at times. And, and then in the end, you ended up with Bob Cole and helping him. Yeah. Well, Milsey, I would just say I don't think anybody helped Bob more than you did because you were his, his no, partner for that. a long time. And, um, you know, uh, I, I remember, I guess we can tell this story now because uh, it's harmless, but, Milsey, you remember we did a Pittsburgh Philly series. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to tell this story. Was Bob, <laughs> and he was pounding, I mean, he was pounding back the rum and coke, and he was so happy. I mean, like, 
you know, like that, that's just like, like, you know what, uh, Johnny, like, and Millsy, it's like when Millsy, when everybody who retires from elite level sports, the, what's the thing they always say? They miss the buses. They miss yeah. the plane rides. They miss, like, when this is all gone for all of us guys, I, like, JB, that's the stuff I'm going to yeah. miss. They don't make them like that anymore. Um, oh. People who just didn't care what they said, what they, it was never anything offensive. It was never anything that would hurt anyone. He just loved to be Bob. And I, I don't know if you were there the day that he punched me while I was driving. Like it was, it, like it was crazy stuff. And plus he was such, like the, the, the thing I'll always remember, Millsy, is that um, he was like the way everybody treated him when he walked into a building. Oh, yes. Bob oh yeah. yeah. Bob Cole's here. And uh, you need the lines with, with minor exceptions. Do you need the lines? You know, how can we help you, Bob? And, uh, oh, I mean, Millsy, you saw it more than I did because I left to go into the studio and you were still there. But holy cow, like, uh, it was unbelievable. Like, I, I will tell the one story. My first broadcast, it was actually it was Harry Neal and Bob. We're in Ottawa for Ottawa, Montreal. And um, it, I was actually early, which is not normal. And we come out That's of the hotel and they've got the shuttle for us to drive us over to the rink and Harry's in the back seat and I go into the back and Harry's like, you know, Elliot, Bob and I like to sit in the back and talk about the game. You sit in the front. I'm like, sure. He goes, yeah. Bob comes out, stops, sees me in the front, stops, opens the door. Young man, you might think you're big, but I sit in the front seat here and Harry's <laughs> laughing. Yeah. I had to sit in the front seat uh, on, the rink, on the way to the rink. And, and that yeah. was that was the rule, as you and, know. It. And I'll tell you, there was one other one, too, like that. We were doing a playoff series, and I can't remember, Millsy, if you did this one with us, but it was Boston, Montreal. And we landed in Boston's airport from Montreal. And it was about a year or two in. And, uh, you know, we, th we put all our gear, our, our luggage in the back of the, uh, of the taxi cab. And I, I took, like, a half step towards the front, like, not even a half step. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I go into the back seat. And he goes, he sits to the front, he turns around, he goes, Elliot, do you think I missed that you took a step towards the front seat? And I was like, how, how did you know? He, he was so miss. proud of himself that he noticed that. <laughs> he didn't miss anything. No. By the way, and it's just a, a, a side story about the respect you talk about with Bob Cole. He told me last night, guess who called him? And I bet you know who it is. Sidney Crosby. How yes. Are, yeah. How are, how are you, Bob? Yes. Okay. It tells mm -hmm. you about two things. It tells you mm -hmm. about Sidney. And it tells you about the respect that Bob has. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, people, people love him. Absolutely. Yeah. You've had a chance to, through these experiences on Hockey Night, uh, but also from the writing, the balancing, 31 Thoughts, um, the studio work, you really kind of have versatility to you, not just in hockey, but as we talked about, you did basketball, you've had an opportunity to do baseball, uh, football, uh, Olympics. Uh, versatility is probably one of the big words we could use when we talk about your career. How do you sort of look at that um, as an advantage for everything you do with the fact that you're not just sort of locked into one thing? Well, I think if you're going to be successful in our business now, you have to be more technically versatile than uh, editorial versatile. Like, you know, you got to know how to use Zoom. you got to know how to use all those different things we talked about before. Instagram lives, um, Snapchat. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing Instagram lives now where there's, uh, I saw one the other day that had 40,000 people on it. And I was like, holy smokes. Like wow. my, mine aren't getting the 40,000 people on that. I can tell you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just think that you, you have to be versatile that way. You know, I loved it. Uh, you know, I, I think what it did for me, John was, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I, I grew up in Toronto, middle class background. I've, I've traveled a bit, but I spent most of my life here, uh, you know, 45 years here in Fort Western. What it allowed me to do was meet a lot of people who came from a lot of different places. And that first year when the Raptors first arrived, I didn't have a single thing in common with any of the players who played on that team. None of the coaches on that team, Isaiah Thomas. But what it taught me is if you have respect for each other, then you can build relationships. And I thought that was so important that you didn't have to look at anybody else any differently because they were from anywhere else. 
is, okay, do I, do, do I respect this person at their job, that they're doing a job, and they respect me, and they see your face around where they say, okay, I can trust that guy. And the thing that I learned, John, more than anything else, and it's harder now for the role I have, FaceTime is so important. Mm-hmm. Like that is the mm-hmm. thing I miss about what you guys do. You go into the building, you see people, you talk to people. Like I, I, I miss that. I am envious of that part of your job that you get to see people and they get to see you because nothing beats face-to-face contact. So on, yeah, that, on that note, can you, do you have a story or two about when you really got heck? from one of the managers or oh my god yeah well there must be a couple of beauties along the way i know that because managers are like all of us they're very competitive yeah they hear everything even though they tell you that they don't hear a thing they listen all the time yeah so there might be oh yeah there might be a couple of fun ones that you could tell perhaps i'm putting you on the spot i know but well no it's okay maybe maybe, maybe one that for the fans that would be interested sure um I don't like to name names because I like, no, especially of, no. of active guys. Well, I'll t- because exactly like, I, I don't want people to think that, you know, like I, first of all, I, I don't want to act like, Oh, I got in these fights with guys to sound like a big shot because I think some people do that. I don't like that. Uh, and also like at the end of the day, I still got to cover uh, teams properly. Mm-hmm. And so I don't like to say, Oh, I, I hate this guy. So they think I, have anything negative to say about the team. One has nothing to do with the other. Um, when Berkey, I don't mind saying this now because we worked together. When Berkey was GM of the Leafs, um, he got so angry at me and I thought he was ridiculous. We didn't talk to each other for a year. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Like we didn't talk to each other for a year. And I remember Pat Quinn actually got mad at something um, and Pat did an interview. Do you remember the year, Millsy, where the Leafs and, and Johnny were – the Leafs were the eighth seed in the East, they, again, and they beat Ottawa in the first round, oh, yeah. but they only made the playoffs like the day before the regular season ended. Well, there was a lot of stress that week, and they um, – and Quinn agreed to an interview with me, and he said some things. He, he admitted to me later he regretted saying. Like he, he took some – he took some, made some really blunt comments about his team, And he got mad and uh, he didn't want the interview to run. And I said, you know, it's, it's going to run. And we didn't talk for a year. And I remember when that broke was the, what it, when it ended was he got sick and he missed a playoff game against Carolina a year later. And when he came back, I just walked by him and I said, you know, I'm glad you're healthy. And he kind of winked. And then we started kind of talking to each other. Then we got on along great. Um, you know, he did tell me later, he said he watched me closely for a year to see if I would, you know, take shots of them because we weren't talking and I never did. And he kind of respected that. I, I think one of the biggest ones in the, like lately, you know, I think Millsy, what happens now is guys don't like information getting out. Right. And it makes them crazy if we find something out that they don't want out there. So there are battles from time to time. And, um, Some of them are personal and some of them last longer than others. And you just, you know, sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong about how I handle them and and how it goes. So uh, I would say there was one, and I won't say who it was with. This is about, this has got to be about 10 years ago now where I got into it with a general manager on the draft floor. And he was swearing at me and I was swearing at him. and. It was not too loud, but loud enough that people could see it. And there were like other GMs. They were like, whoa, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. Loving it, right? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I was was so embarrassed. Like, I don't want to do that where anyone can see it. It's not good for anybody. But that was probably the one. Like, I have, Millsy, I still have people who, who say to me, like, they, like, they'd never seen that side of me before or since. And it was, it was really something. Uh, it, was, it was really something. Is that the hardest part of your job when you're balancing between having relationships with some of these people, being a trusted insider, and sort of walking what is really a delicate line for you to walk all the time? Is that the hardest part for what you do? No. You know, I, you know, I, I think the toughest thing, JB, is that when I was started out, 
and I was 20, 25 years old, I was, you know, I was a young single guy and I brought the heat all the time. And I think now that I'm getting to 50, I understand now I have a family. I've got, a, as, as Millsy mentioned, uh, I, have a, I have a wife and son now. I, I see the effect that it has on people. I think I'm a lot softer than I used to be. And some people say, oh, you've gone soft. And I'm like, fine, if that's how you feel. I really try now to recognize that. Like there are, there are times, JB, where I know I'm going to write something or say something, and it's going to affect someone because it's a trade rumor or something like that. Yeah. That to me is the, I am so much more aware now of the effect that these things have on people, and especially in the social media world. Cause you know, you, you know, it, it goes viral. It's so quick. It's crazy. That to me, I'm, I think that's the toughest thing is just trying to be more aware of uh, the effect that my reporting can have on people. On that note, 31 thoughts. I mean, every week you've got to come up, with 31 thoughts. And mm -hmm. I know how hard you work on that. How tough is it? And uh, it's quite a, it's become quite a, quite a thing. I mean, in the hockey world, everybody waits for it, including myself. Well, uh, one of our coworkers, Damian Cox used to call it 15 thoughts spread out into 31. Uh, <laughs> There's only Damian would. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you very much. Uh, Brian, Brian Burke's nickname for it is 31 turds. Uh, he'll like say to me, have, have you written 31 turds yet this week? Um, you know, like I, I like doing it, Millsy. It's a, it's a challenge. I mean, but the number one reason I like doing it is because people read it. You know, if, if, if no one read it, it wouldn't be fun. Um, you know, people read it to people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, I, I'm just, I, I'm surprised at the reach it's kind of gotten. Um, but I, I like doing it. I, I, I really like the challenge of it to find new things. And, uh, uh, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy doing it. Well, now it's spawned into the podcast, of course. And then even now video interviews you get to have with players. So it's, it's really taken on a new life, hasn't it? It has, uh, Bennington was really good the other day. I, I really enjoyed doing it with him. I think he's a, <clears throat> I think he's really good. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I always hated like uh, the word brand, like it's your brand. I mean, I've always hated that, but I guess it's, I guess it's my brand. Yeah. Yeah. Riley, he was good too. Really yeah. good. Now we do have to ask you because Rick Ball gave you an awful shot. I, and, and our upcoming show is about your, about your beard. <laughs> so, <laughs> and everybody's asking. So, you know, there's got to be a story there. Is there a story there somewhere? I, I got to tell you, Mills. He thinks this is better. He has a better beard to begin with, I think. But he thinks, well, thinks look, that, wild. it's a low bar. Like, come on. Like, you know, Rick's <laughs> going to be proud of that. You know, I, I will say this, Millsy, that out of nowhere, like, you know, we're all sending notes to each other. Everybody doing okay. Uh, I got a note the other day from one of your closest friends as a player. Uh, uh, Ron Francis, just seeing what was going on. And he said, I can't wait till you get rid of that thing. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, right. But, but uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I just wanted to see what it would be like to look like growing a beard. And I don't share a lot of pictures, but I did in the summer and people were like, wow. And uh, look, like, you know, this is not an easy time for a lot of people. And I think it's a fun thing. You know, if people can laugh at it and people can make fun of it and Rick Ball can make jokes at it and people can look at it and say, oh, my God, and it can make them laugh for two minutes, ah, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm good with that. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we, we miss all the notes. You and I sometimes text on the suits that we're wearing. So yeah, this yeah. is a very different uh, element that we're in right now than uh, I can you comment on you, your T-shirt. You, but <laughs> you poodles in your suits. I mean, seriously. <laughs> You know what? I got to tell you, Milsey, I never cared about it. And Deb Berman, who was the MVP of Rogers, we all know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. like, I, I, I want to try some stuff with you. And, you know, you get older and you're like, okay, let's have some fun. And I think some of the stuff is great. And then the socks, right? Your son picks the socks out, I hear. Yes, he did. He yeah. has yeah. picked some out. But yeah. they blocked it so it can't be seen anymore. I think it drove certain people crazy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all part of the fun of the wardrobe. My daughter picks the socks too. And yeah, Deb's awesome. And uh, 
Lou Vina. I always, I always joke, we're going to call it Lou Wear, and we're going to patent it. All our suits uh, that we get to wear with our designs, call it Lou Wear. It's fun to wear. So, But you and I get into a lot of the fun patterns, so I like that stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you- Millsy, before, I, uh, before this wraps up, because I know the meeting time is getting a bit low, I, there's a couple yeah. of things I'd like to say, JB, about Greg Millen. And, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Some, <laughs> some of it's overly nice and, and some of it isn't. But... <laughs> You know, I have to say that when I first started, um, you know, Millsy, I remember that uh, Millsy would do the late games, the West, with, with Chris Cuthbert. And I didn't do a lot of West games. Oki did. But I remember the first times I went out there, like I wouldn't go into coaches' meetings really because I was new and I wanted to respect uh, the space of people that had been there before me. And I remember Millsy said, um, you know, Elliot, no, you're part of the team. And uh, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. And I always appreciated that, Greg. Like, oh, no, 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 you. you're part of the team and you come in and you do it. But, JB, the other thing that Millsy really helped me with was uh, he was one of a couple of guys and uh, Glenn Healy was another and Millsy was one too, who said to me, we don't like, you, you don't watch practice properly. And this was a huge part of my uh, development. So I came to Hockey Night when I was 33 years old. And, you know, like a lot of us, JB, we go to practice and we BS and we talk and we talk about what's going on. And both Healy and Millsy were like, no, you don't, you don't watch practice right. And I said, okay, like how do I watch practice right? Who's the coach talking to? When does the drill stop? Why does the coach draw the, uh, uh, do the drill, blow the drill dead? Who's he talking to on the ice? How long's the conversation? Does he look mad? Who runs the drill first? Who does the drill properly? Craig Simpson was a guy. He always said to me, on the drill, the forward stop right at the net. And I really do believe, and I, I like to tell this story for all the young people who want to get into sports. You know, hockey is one of the few sports where we're lucky enough to watch practice anymore. Basketball, you can't watch practice. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. Baseball, you can watch batting practice, which is, uh, but football, you can't watch practice. Yeah. And I really thought that for all the young people out there who think that practice is just a big waste of time for media, it's not. And Millsy and Healy and, and Simmer and were those guys who taught me, you know what? If you really want to be good at this, you have to do a better job of watching practice. I always remember that. That's nice. And we do have to bring up one small thing because <laughs> Kelly Rudy was... Uh, oh, not uh, this. I, I, have you worked on your basketball skills at all? Because uh, I understand that uh, a couple of old, you know, goalies uh, schooled you on the road at one point in your career. I've just heard that. You know, JB, you you had to see this. this <laughs> I've heard about it. Legendary. I, I gotta I, tell I you, describe it to you. I've heard about it. You know, you know, you know. There's this times in your life where you're kind of cocky and you need to get your ass kicked to kind of. This was one of those times. Two thousand, yeah. two thousand seven Stanley Cup Final, basketball court at the hotel. I absolutely like it was fun. We went out there. It was Millsy, Rudy, and Joel Darling, who's a Joel's a big guy. He's about six yeah. four. Yeah. And he's dirty. He was just fouling like crazy. It was terrible. <laughs> and it was Brian Spear, one of our producers, and myself, and another producer, Mike Dodson. And Spears, he played pretty well, but I sucked. I had a terrible game, and Dodson was worse. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, like, the thing about it is you forget that Rudy and Milsey were high-level athletes. Like, even though they're old enough, like, how, in uh, 2007, Millsy, how old were you? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I don't know. How, how are you making I, them do math? <laughs> I can't you know, like, do math. Thir- 13 years ago. How old were yeah, you? Yeah, well, I'm 62 now, so there so you go. So you're 49. 49. Yeah, okay, so yeah. I, I'm 37, okay, at the time. And Rudy's got to be about your age, maybe a little yeah, bit younger. Yeah, a couple of younger years younger. Yeah, so, but, like, you know what the thing was? Like, Millsy's, like, he keeps on t- – the worst thing about Millsy is <laughs> he's got that – like this now, he's got that stupid grin on his face. Oh, yeah. Like yes. Kel- Kelly's got the wry uh-huh. smile like, oh, yeah, we're humiliating these guys. Millsy's just like, let the ball do all the work. That's all he's saying the whole game. <laughs> I had to get in your head. We weren't very good. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. It, it was, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to now admit one thing. Yeah. I've never admitted to you, but we'll do okay. it today. I have never in my life been so fluky and hit so many baskets from everywhere in my entire – it would never happen again. And Rudes was the same way. We could not miss that day. And, really? I, have no, and I have no idea why. 
Well, you, know, you couldn't miss, but it was the, you know what it was? Honestly, it was not that you couldn't miss. <laughs> it was just how like fluid you guys looked. You ah. guys actually looked like, well, we tricked you. You, you guys <laughs> ran circles around us. Like that was the worst <laughs> thing about it at all. John, like, it, it still was, bothers him, which is so uh, good. It's oh, still yeah. bothering him. I, I got to oh, yeah. tell you, like, a few years ago, I played golf with Pierre Lebrun, and we, uh, you know, we were tied with, like, nine holes left, or with, like, five holes left. And he's like, let's put down 50 bucks on who wins now. And I imploded. I lost by, like, 10 <laughs> shots. It was so bad. And then, you know, and, and it was like that. But this was worse because – they had these stupid freaking grins every time they saw us for the rest of the Stanley Cup. Thank God that was a five-game series because I couldn't oh, take it anymore. That is true. We couldn't help it. Yeah. And, that is, and that is exactly what you were talking about earlier. It won't be the games that we'll all remember. Just yeah. like teammates, we remember all the great stories and times with our teammates. Uh, great teammates like yourself, Elliot. So uh, we appreciate that. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know we're short on time now, but uh, – We'll have to get you back again to continue talking more and get some other good stories out of you. And uh, maybe one of these days, a rematch on the basketball court uh, might be. Yeah. I, I'm going to wait until he's 80. Then I think yeah. I have a chance. <laughs> well, I'll Thanks tell you for what, having me. On a serious note, Elliot, it's been an honor to watch your career the way it's gone from day Thanks, one. guys. You know, quite, it's quite it, remarkable. You know what? It's all about the teammates, guys. And you guys are great teammates. And I'm glad to, I'm glad to be around you. Feeling yeah. mutual, my friend. Feeling is definitely mutual. Thanks, Elliot. Take care and stay safe. Take care, guys. You too. Elliot is certainly one of the nicest guys in the industry, and he is a better basketball player than he showed when he played you and Kelly Rudy. <laughs> Without question. And he wonders why we enjoyed it so much and smiled because of his reaction. I think it still bothers him. It's kind of fun. Uh, and like he said, it's the friends that we make in the industry yeah. that are the memories that will last a lifetime. That's it for this edition of From the Booth. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And follow all of Elliot's work with 31 Thoughts and more on sportsnet.ca.